Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and in recognition of World Health Day today, we'll be discussing the important topic of mental health and emotional well-being in the workplace. We're talking to leaders who promote better workplace mental health and address issues for employers and employees, and our special guests today are Christina McCarthy, Operations and Member Engagement Director at One Mind at Work in California, Rachel Steinmetz, Workplace Mental Health Director at the National Alliance on Mental Illness in New York City, and Kelly Greenwood, Founder and CEO at Mindshare Partners in San Francisco. So thank you all for joining us. It's just wonderful to see you. In the last decade, we seem to have accepted that mental health is part of human health, but that very healthy attitude doesn't necessarily extend to the workplace, right? This, it's, it's, it's so amazing because we spend a third of our lives working and then we ignore mental health when we're working. That doesn't, that, that doesn't make any sense. And it's something that you are all here to discuss and, and repair. Depression and forms of repetitive and different forms of repetitive stress injury and PTSD are not uncommon in the workplace and, and it can readily affect uh, on-the-job performance and employee retention. Just 57% of employees who report moderate depression and 40% reporting severe depression receive treatment. So we're way, way off the curve there. And that results in retention issues. It results in poor performance. So we do very little to help 43 to 60% of those reporting just depression. And there are other there are other issues here that that we'd like to unpack, starting with you, Kelly. Um, so could you just sort of describe how you see this topic, how you see some of the challenges and what we should be doing? And, and I, I'm thinking also in terms of return on investment and time, right? Investing a little bit of time, a little, a little bit of capital can have really big, big impacts when it comes to mental health and and people f- uh, retaining joy in their work, uh, can it? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. It's great to be here today. Um, I mean, to your point about how we think about mental health, you know, first of all, we very much see it as a spectrum that we all go back and forth on throughout the course of our lives. And so we're not just talking about diagnosable mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, but we're also talking about stress, burnout, and sort of that that whole in-between area. So, you know, up to 80% of us will have a diagnosable mental health condition at some point in our life, uh, whether we know it or not. So for a bit of context, um, you know, Mindshare Partners is a national nonprofit that's changing the culture of workplace mental health so that both organizations and employees can thrive. And we're really ultimately trying to normalize what it looks like to have a mental health challenge at work and reduce that stigma and address the workplace factors that can contribute to poor mental health so that we don't end up with just a Band-Aid solution. So and we just also a part of just sort of talking about the fact that we are all in this sort of mental health soup, right? I mean, we're, there's, there's really no distinction between individuals in the sense of we're all participants in this, in this issue. Absolutely. You know, in our 2021 Mental Health at Work report, in partnership with Qualtrics and ServiceNow, we actually saw that mental health challenges are now the norm among all employees. So 76% of respondents reported at least one symptom of a mental health condition in the last year, and that was up from 59% in our 2019 study. So I think, obviously, the pandemic, um, the systemic racism that keeps happening, and frankly, the global challenge of the month, uh, unfortunately, for the last two years have all contributed to this. And so I think, you know, one silver lining of the last two years is that we've seen in our work with companies and organizations is that more people are really willing to be vulnerable and open up about their challenges at work, since literally everyone has been struggling with something and really continuing to move past that stigma is huge. Um, You know, it really would have made all the difference for me when I was struggling with my own generalized anxiety disorder and and depression at work. So Rachel, how do you see the the way this field has evolved? Because we, we went from utter denial to somewhat acceptance, and then we've all now moved to Zoom and these kinds of platforms in order to work. We've got a remote work situation, which brings a different sense of of both isolation and opportunity in terms of communication and even private communication, which we didn't necessarily have previously in the workplace. 
How do you see this whole topic evolving um, in, in this sort of rapid way? Having done this work, you know, prior to the pandemic, my last day in the office when I was working for New York City, I'd gone to a large insurance company and they said, we're sorry, we just sent everyone home. The front door is locked. And that was my last day in the office until and that was when New York City just shut down two years ago. So obviously everything about where and how we work has changed and the collective trauma of COVID-19 has really affected everyone. At NAMI NYC, we're a peer-led organization. So everyone who works here, we all have lived experience with mental illness and or our caregivers. And I think the pandemic has also really brought to the forefront the challenges and mental health challenges of caregivers, whether you're caring for someone with a mental illness or a young child or someone uh, an elderly parent, it's really made it impossible to ignore. And I've really seen a shift in, you know, CEOs I worked with in the past would never have talked about mental health, sending out weekly emails to their staff and holding town hall meetings to check in. In the nonprofit space, especially, I myself um, worked in supportive housing um, and worked for several mental health nonprofits, including now. But I think there are other unique challenges in the nonprofit world and social services that COVID really hit. You know, how do you provide services to people when you can't see them? For people who have low computer literacy or lack of access to internet services, how are you reaching them out? And it was incredible to watch folks really sort of step up their game to reach out their participants. But again, it wasn't always focusing on the staff. And now we're at a point where we really need to think about how are we supporting our staff's mental health now that we're out of this you know, immediate crisis? How are we setting up systems so that everyone can really experience good mental health at work? You know, folks are so focused on their clients and many of the services, which I love and admire. And I hope part of my role at NAMI NYC's workplace program is to help people know that you matter and that you know, your mental health is a part of this too. So, uh, Christina, when you look at the distinction between the terms mental health and mental illness, do you create a distinction there? Do you think that we should use one term over the other, or does one term have a particular definition versus another another term? Because part of this is we want to remove the stigma so we can actually deal with it. Stigma is suppressive, right? People don't talk about things that come with stigma. But if you remove the stigma, you can actually talk. So talk about this, this sort of terminology, right? Mental health versus mental illness. Sure. Thanks. It's, it's a really great question. I think it's something that, that organizational leaders really struggle with. It's a barrier for them and, and having a roadmap to address this issue for themselves and, and within the workplace. And it's a focus for us at One Mind at Work to really support leaders in, in navigating some of these decisions. You know, we have a very similar philosophy to, to Kelly at Mindshare Partners. Mental health is a continuum. And we certainly want to be mindful and responsive to the people who are experiencing acute needs, but we also want to protect the folks who are thriving and flourishing right now. And we want to make sure that we are limiting exposure to environmental factors that might move them along the continuum into a period of stress or anxiety, um, and also do what we can to support those folks who are kind of in the middle, right? What are the protective factors we can consider? And so the thinking about this or using the term mental illness really puts that focus on the individuals who are in need of more serious interventions. It's a really important population, but it's not the majority of the population all of the time, right? So we want to think comprehensively and the workplace is a critical lever to support everybody across this continuum. Employers can play a role certainly in providing access to benefits and services that help people who need it when they need it and can think structurally about what they can do to limit those environmental factors. How can the workplace become protective? How can it play a productive role in preventing people from feeling the anxiety and burnout that might push them further down the continuum away from where we want them to be. I think for me, the distinction is when I'm, a, I, I think we're all in a mental health soup, right? So for me, the distinction between that and mental, and mental illness is when I'm considering my own sort of ups and downs, depression, anxieties, and so on and so forth, if I can manage them, and bring myself into some uh, form of, of sort of a sustainable attitude, um, reasonably positive. I'm in the mental health area. 
But when I no longer can can find my way there and I need help, I tip into the mental illness area, right? And and asking for help, whether it's from fa- from friends or from a doctor, um, or um, or from a counselor of some sort, or a meditation coach, or whatever it happens to be, is just I, I'm in that state. I, I need to have that that help, and and it can become uh, very extreme. Kelly, how do you see that distinction? Yeah, you know, I agree with everything that Christina said, and I I absolutely think that sort of the acute mental health population is incredibly important, and uh, you know, it is in- incredibly incredibly critical to have workplaces really support everyone along the way to really ensure that we're not getting to that point. I think, Mark, to your point around. Uh, you know, kind of seeking help or not, I actually don't necessarily know that I would say that's the primary distinction. You know, I I myself am in therapy um, all the time, every two weeks without fail. And for the most part, that's a preventative vehicle for me. So, you know, I think that it actually does a disservice to think too much about, you know, how do we characterize um, something or not? I think we can all benefit from help in various um, capacities all the time. Um, And I do think that the way we think about language, um, to your point, you know, can definitely um, be either helpful or harmful. You know, one of the things that we often talk about when we're doing trainings with with companies and nonprofits is, is that, you know, really being mindful of your language, naming stress and burnout and depression as it's appropriate, not sort of just using fluff language like well-being, Uh, But then simultaneously watching your words on the other end, you know, a lot of times people will say like, oh, that's so crazy or she's so OCD or I'm really feeling bipolar today. And and that's, you know, really just doing a disservice to folks who may be struggling with that. So we really try to focus on inclusion as much as possible. That's so interesting. So you're basically saying um, uh, understand that the terms that you use may be perceived by somebody else in a way that you don't intend. Or that Absolutely. may cause cause harm, but you're also saying that you know you kind of have to decide for yourself how you're going to confront this issue. Uh, Rachel, could you talk a little bit about the National Alliance and the role that you play in in uh, bringing uh, some sort of um, rationality uh, to this this whole um, uh, field um, and of, of workplace mental health? Yes, and I think really to echo what Kelly said about the importance of language. So at NAMI NYC, our workplace mental health program focuses both on how can we support people who, you know, are experiencing mental health challenges in the workplace to not just, you know, that as the World Health Organization says, health is not merely absence of disease. So really using a health promotion, public health approach in that respect, but also while work can, you know, really Uh, negatively affect your mental health in many ways. Lots of people with mental illnesses really want to contribute to the workforce and it's an important part of their recovery. And so we work with folks, you know, with serious mental illness and also folks who are in companies to really think about these issues of creating an environment where everyone can thrive. And so to piggyback on what Kelly said about person first language, you know, not describing people as crazy or psycho, I think, one story in one of our support groups of someone talking about his sister had been recently diagnosed with schizophrenia and folks in his workplace were coming in and just talking about, you know, a lot of homeless people and saying really horrific things, you know, assuming that they were mentally ill, assuming that all of this was related. And he talked about how hurtful it felt, but that this isn't, but that he didn't feel like he could say anything because then they might think there's something wrong with him. Um, Or then, you know, they might just feel uncomfortable. I think stigma can be really insidious in the workplace uh, and show up in ways that we don't necessarily think about. And so again, like, look, it's, you know, person first language is important. We all make mistakes. I definitely don't always say the correct words at the right time, but it's really just having an awareness that your words matter and that you don't know what everyone else's experience is. And in the workplace, uh, that matters, you know, that everyone needs to be able to feel supported in the workplace, regardless of those situations. Christina, um, I have a question for you. Given this this sort of uh, the, these series of topics, and it really it really comes down to 
Uh, two two points. One that that Rachel made. Maybe we should give each other a break in terms of our our terminology as well, but also be more sensitive to how our terminology can can affect others, which is a point that Kelly made. But I'd also like to talk about the question of of codependency. To what extent do we end up with a situation where we're frozen in place because we're so worried about? Um, not saying the wrong thing, not using a term, not using a particular term, or using the right term, or whatever. That we stop even communicating. We stop. We stop interacting. We we become frozen. We we we're always so concerned about anything we might do that we actually do nothing. We don't we don't talk about these things, and and that doesn't that's not going to help either. How do, how do right. we, how do you see this? I'm so glad that you linked these two important points, because I think, you know, language is one very concrete example of where where we can fall down sometimes, even people who are working in this space. Right. We are constantly learning about how how to use language in productive and effective ways. Um, We also want to encourage organizational leaders to be comfortable with being uncomfortable especially at the beginning of this journey, nobody is going to get it right. Nobody's going to get it right all the time. And and you're probably not going to get it right at the very beginning. That should by no means prevent you from taking action and from considering what you can do as an employer, whether you're a small organization or a large organization, to make a difference. Well, maybe it's also inevitable that we will periodically get it wrong, each of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think being... Being honest about that, being upfront from the very beginning to say, you know, we are, we as an organization are going to take on supporting our employees from a mental health perspective in the workplace. And we are not going to get it right all the time. We're going to make some mistakes. We want to have an open dialogue with you, our employees and our community about how we can serve you better, right? That's a level of vulnerability that takes uh, a little bit of courage but is really going to allow that organization to build a thriving and sustainable culture. And that's what we're looking for, right? We're not looking for um, flashy campaigns that, you know, hit you once or twice and then disappear. We're looking to really move the needle in the long term. Can we pick on Amazon for a second? Because I always like picking on the biggest, wealthiest, most well-known company that we all use periodically and so on. It seems that there's been a lot of uh, a talk in the in, in the uh, papers um, and in the media about um, the various uh, issues that people who work for Amazon seem to have in terms of of uh, physical um, uh, risks from these repetitive um, actions that are being taken place, the stress of the workplace of filling those orders, being treated li- like machine being machines being watched all the time. From a mental health perspective, Kelly, just sort of looking at at what you know about those types of workplaces, um, how does an employer find the right balance to help in in terms of alleviating the kinds of stresses that employees have that lead to unhappiness and sometimes uh, real real, uh, concern and action? We've just seen unionization take place because of some of these issues. How How does a big company like that deal with these kinds of, of, of issues in a way that makes individuals feel like their needs are attended to? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great and also very complicated question. You know, we think about um, different types of employees, right? So knowledge workers, frontline workers. And so I think when you're referring to Amazon, you're probably referring more to the frontline workers in those factories. And that you know, when we again talk about mental health and culture change, but even and- even the people who are designing the systems that are that are monitoring the employees, because you know those people don't want to create injury through their systems. So I'm I'm actually talking about the entire thing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think ultimately at Mindshare, when we're talking about culture change and culture change of any kind really requires a top down and a bottoms up approach. So it needs ideally CEO support as well as a grassroots groundswell. You know, again, without knowing the nuances of of Amazon, I I think that both of those really need to be in place. Um, 
And it's both addressing and understanding and appreciating the importance of workplace mental health. Um, you know, I think a lot of companies, um, especially during the last two years, have really gone to benefits in terms of trying to solve the mental health problem versus realizing that it is actually the culture and, and taking accountability for the, the factors that the workplace is actually contributing to stress, burnout, repetitive injury, as you say. Um, and so I think for frontline workers, it does become more complicated because there are so many of those workplace factors that um, are not supportive of mental health, right? You know, shift work, um, not, not very many breaks, um, all of that. And so I do think that that requires a, a big systemic change and sort of thinking through those levers versus, um, you know, putting in meditation rooms for the five minute break is, is not going to be the, the long term fix. Well, that's interesting. So the point, the point being that it might actually be in the financial interest of certain, in certain situations to not deal with the mental health issues, because if you don't deal with them, you're not, you're not creating costs and you're not creating a diversion from the work that is generating profit. Rachel, how do you, how do you see this issue? Well, I think that something that can be challenging when talking about workplace mental health is that helping people to be resilient or reduce their stress isn't about accepting unacceptable situations and unacceptable workforce issues. I would say you can't really talk about workplace mental health if people don't have, you know, aren't receiving good wages and good health care and are not, you know, working in safe environments where there might be sort of productivity quotas that just you cannot work that safely. So unfortunately, at that point, I think in some ways it can be kind of cruel to talk about workplace mental health because people are working in really abhorrent situations. And I just, you know, without this sort of baseline needs being met of physical safety and, you know, financial safety, I don't think we're at a place where we can talk about mental health. That's really, that's really a very, a very good uh, point. This whole idea that that maybe the mental health dialogue is, is it really comes at a certain point in where you are, where you're physically safe and, and where uh, you can actually communicate and so on and so forth. In terms of, of the polls that we've had, um, it's interesting. We, we asked how often uh, workplaces provide some sort of mental health support. And we found that 80% of respondents said that, that their workplaces did supply some sort of support. Christina, is that about right in terms of your experience? Is it is it that high in the United States that there's some form of workplace support? Um, and is it adequate? Well, I think those are two very different questions. In terms of what's being provided, that, that seems consistent with what we're hearing from our members. And I think um, aligns with what Kelly said earlier about this tendency to think about benefits and services as a solution. It's a place where I think employers feel comfortable going. They can think about their EAP. They can think about introducing access to apps um, that are maybe sort of the shiny new thing without fully understanding what problem they're trying to solve first. So you but know, it's better, the it's better is, than it was. It used to, people didn't, did, so let's let's. It's better than it was. Right? There's been progress. There's been movement in, you know, understanding that there are serious issues of access and employers need to do better, both in terms of insurance coverage, but also opening their network to more providers. There, there are structural issues at play here. There's a shortage of providers that, you know, an individual organization can't solve. Um, but I think we also have to really pressure businesses to think about what their objectives are and introducing these solutions and thinking about strategies and not, again, taking a sort of surgical or Band-Aid approach, but thinking comprehensively about what they're trying to do for their workforce. And then what are the solutions and programming and strategies and leadership engagement that they need to facilitate and foster to get there? Um, it's interesting. We just completed a poll, which is about the types of support that is provided. How does your employer support mental health of employees? We asked a whole bunch of different we provided a whole bunch of different options. The two options that received the most votes is there's access to a mental health professional or treatment, either through insurance or, or through other services. And, um, and this is a very interesting one. Uh, employees are helped by, by allowing for scheduling flexibility, by basically providing a, a safety relief valve. Are there other 
um, ways that employers can shape the work experience that reduces the uh, stress that that uh, people feel on the job, Kelly. Are there things that we can do that are quite benign, that are sustainable, that are not viewed by managers as being at odds with the business model, but could be really enormously helpful? Absolutely. And again, I think this answer changes depending on what category and type of worker we're looking at. Um, but for knowledge workers in particular, um, you know, one thing that we really talk about a lot is inclusive flexibility, right? So everybody can benefit from flexibility, what that looks like from person to person, and even within the same person at different points of time is different. And so that may be communication norms um, around, you know, response times required for emails, um, especially as a lot of us are still working remotely, trying to get clear on boundaries between, you know, work and home um, so that we're not driving that burnout. So I think that there's definitely a lot that can be done in terms of creating those sustainable workplaces. Um, you know, one thing that I did want to name too, um, you know, is just the importance of DEI and being really intentional about thinking about DEI, both mental health as a new DEI category in and of itself, as we're seeing, you know, mental health employee resource groups emerge over the last few years, but also really um, understanding how mental health affects different populations differently. You know, so I want to name, unfortunately, we don't have any people of color on this panel. And I can only speak to my lived experience as a white woman with two small kids uh, who is navigating generalized anxiety disorder. But, um, you know, based on different cultural norms, stigma in many communities of color um, is, is a hurdle and access to those services can be more challenging, not to mention finding therapists of color. And in the workplace too, you know, in my early career in management consulting, I was definitely by far in the minority as a woman. And it was hard for me to feel like I could raise my hand um, when I was already part of an underrepresented community and I didn't want to create additional barriers and challenge. You know, we've seen that it others you further and it's even harder for the superstars of the world like, you know, Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles to be able to do that. And so it's really important for organizations to also think about in investing and in alleviating systemic barriers. I also think one of the barriers is, has to do with um, with the type of work and the income levels of people, where the people at the higher uh, levels of income um, gain more access, the people at the lower incomes gain uh, less access, and there's less toleration. There was a um, poll that we just completed uh, called Talking About It, and uh, we said, would you feel comfortable opening up to your manager about work-related stress? And it was interesting, um, only a third said, yes, they'd feel comfortable, but, um, but two thirds said they'd either prefer to speak with somebody outside of that context, or they would want to, but would fear it. So that's really interesting. And then when you talk about then uh, differences in terms of race or religion or orientation or gender and so on, it becomes even more complicated. Um, Rachel, we're going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our uh, of our uh, time. If you were going to recommend that we do one thing as a society better, one thing, what would that thing be? If if if, if I was going to change my behavior as a person or as somebody who is uh, leading a firm, um, what what should I do better? I only get one thing. I would say train okay. your managers to talk about mental health in the workplace and how to talk to their employees and how to set up systems to support. I think being a manager is a balancing act, especially right now as we're seeing these return to office policies. It is a really, really tough place to be. And many managers don't receive any training in how to talk about mental health. And this has really come up in the last two years. It has been more challenging with remote work. So I think focusing incorporating leadership support, as Christina said, critical, you know, a necessary step in all of this, but really focusing on those frontline managers who are people's really first contact support in the organization will go a huge way in shifting the culture. And maybe the thing that we all have to do is listen to others, right? Just listen and try to respond in a way that is considerate, that, that takes people's input seriously. It doesn't need to stymie efficiency. As a matter of fact, doing that could actually bring us so many uh, benefits um, and, and make our lives easier. Christina 
McCarthy, Operations and Member Engagement Director at One Mind at Work in California, Rachel Steinitz, Workplace Mental Health Director at the National Alliance on Mental Illness in New York City, and Kelly Greenwood, Founder and CEO at Mindshare Partners in San Francisco. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on this important topic. Please thank your staffs. Please thank your colleagues. Please thank your, your uh, board members and your supporters and your clients uh, for, for your work. We're going to be talking on Tuesday about organizations that are working to make higher education more accessible. Uh, and I hope you'll join us and everyone stay healthy. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.